This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Bear Boat Alaska, a pure DIY hunting game with one of their 37-foot adventure yachts. You and five of your friends can hunt, fish, set crab pots, shrimp pots, and take DIY to the next level. Bear Boat Alaska is locally owned by a Ketchikan resident who lives here year-round. Call Larry at 907-617-4542 or go to bearboatalaska.com. That's B-A-R-E boatalaska.com and tell Larry you heard about it on this podcast. Welcome back to the Mediocre Alaskan Podcast. I have John Abernathy uh, with me today. He just returned from filming Destination Elk with Corey and Donnie in Alaska. How are you feeling, man? Um, I still got a little bit of Alaska uh, hangover going on. It's pretty, a little beat still, which is funny because I think we, you know, not spoiler alert, but we packed out that bull not even like five days ago, four days ago. And uh, it was a nice, brutal awakening uh, from Alaska. Yeah. It's funny that you, people come up here and there's that delay between like when you would actually happen and then you actually post stuff and there's going to be a delay between when this is recorded and put out. Um, Yeah. But are you, you say you feel kind of hungover, like are you reliving like every aspect of it? Is it too much? Do you, there's so much that happens. The most important memories stick out and some of the other subtle ones kind of go by the wayside are you just like remembering more things as you're recalling the trip yeah you definitely i mean definitely reminiscing um it was such a <laughs> i want to say brutal experience i mean i've been in a lot of these you know brutal experiences is what makes the hunt so awesome is when they get super tough like that but yeah i mean it's you do think it's more of like you're thinking about all the things that could have gone wrong when you did something really dumb out there or when you were pushing the edge out there and you're like, man, like we normally push the edge a lot, but in Alaska you push the edge and you're not careful and you, uh, you're a few days from getting out of there. Yeah. So you start thinking about that. (laughs) Yeah. One of the things that I like about, um, your guys's program and actually, do you work for Elk One or you work for, uh, like a, a, a firm that gets hired by Elk 101 guys or something. Yeah, I'm actually, yeah, I am, I am contracted through Elk 101. Um, I actually run my own business. So I'm my own company and I'm, and I'm contracted. But yeah, I work pretty much just exclusively with Elk 101. Okay, cool. Um, one of the things I like about Elk 101 and, and Corey and Donnie is there's an authenticity with them that you don't always get with people who are making content. And you get an idea, you get the feeling that some people will, it doesn't matter what comes in their way. It's just about them and exposure and, and growth and money and all that. Um, whereas the result might be the same. You're still filming a hunt. You're still potentially bringing attention to a new area, but there is a difference if the quality of person that's bringing that out, you're like, yeah, you know what? You might be connecting people with an awesome opportunity and, uh, and you're good dudes. So yeah, it's all right. Do you feel, uh, conflicted at all when, uh, when, when you're going on these hunts and filming them? No, no, it's Corey and Donnie are such good dudes. Um, it's, that's, I mean, I've been working for them now for six years, seven years and filming with them on hunts and, um, and the destination elk we're in season four now destination elk so it's been three years of spending you know pretty much all september with these guys so i spend a lot of time with them um and it's yeah, exa- exactly i mean you hit the nail on the head it's it's authentic Corey and donnie you're not fake you know and, and anyone who's met them you know and goes around to the shows and um and has met them and talked to them in person they know exactly in fact Corey actually hates spotlight <laughs> <laughs> yeah donnie donnie enjoys it just because he's a people person and Corey's not as much of a people person like he like he loves people but he's you know he's a little more introverted so to speak but yeah they're, i mean they're both when you talk to them you tv yeah. and then there's no difference yeah that's anybody who's making any sort of content. Like I'm a writer, you know, I write about, um, you know, I write columns and, and written for magazines and wrote a book. And so there's always the potential for, you know, 
blowing an area up. You know, I'm, I live in Ketchikan. Mm, I talk about Prince yeah. of Wales and I talk about fishing on Prince of Wales. And so, I mean, it's going to get written by someone. So I guess <laughs> it's okay that it's me and that I do it in a way that I would want it to be represented. And I think that's just an important thing. And, um, yeah, I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate what you guys do and just, uh, the, the quality of it and then um, the, the attitude that comes behind it. Yeah, thank you. So what is the route that you take to get to that, to being a filmer? Like you're not, I mean, did you go to school for uh, photography? Did you do some freelance stuff? You know, how many times did, did people reject you, say no? Is there like an old grainy first video out there on YouTube that you shot that's terrible? <laughs> No, I, I actually get this question more often than you think, which is funny because I don't consider myself, you know, any sort of like front runner in the uh, outdoor film industry <clears throat> or anyone of, you know, recognizable importance. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting. In fact, I literally just got an Instagram message yesterday and uh, from some random guy just asking like, hey, how'd you get started? How do you do this? And I was like, man, I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> no, I'm, honestly. <laughs> Um, no, I didn't go to film school, um, uh, film and, and, uh, or videoing and photography. I don't know why I call it film. I didn't film anything. I just always used a camcorder. So video and photography was always just a side hobby, you know, um, that I enjoyed as a, a kind of a teenager, basically started packing a camera around with all sorts of different things and, um, enjoyed videography. So I was like, it's actually, I grew up, not, I shouldn't say grow up, but out of school, um, I was actually a graphic designer for about seven, eight years, but on the side doing video projects for people, filming weddings and that kind of thing, which is a super standard startup. And yeah, it just kind of kept doing it. And then all of a sudden started packing a camera on my hunts because I've been bow hunting elk. Um, actually, surprisingly, I've been, I grew up in Oregon, so I was bow hunting Roosevelt elk um, nice. since I was, since I was 12 years old. So yeah, that's just packing a camera along. That's, that's it. I mean, it was nothing, nothing fancy, nothing special. Just loved it. Just passionate about it. Yeah. I think there's, there's a difference between like active passion and like passive passion. People want to get to where you're at. Hey, how do you get to where you're at? But then when it comes to (laughs) doing what it takes to get there, that's when people aren't willing to do it. Um, I think it was on the Elk Talk podcast yesterday when, when Corey was talking about only 10% of the population has the ambition to make things happen. And that's kind of the difference. Everybody has things that they wish they would do or could do, but it's still yeah, have exactly. the wherewithal to, to do all the struggle through all that stuff to get to where they're at. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. And packing, like actually forcing your, everyone wants to take a camera on their hunt and video it. Everyone wants to, cause you want it. You know, the power behind the video is you want to relive that memory. You want to be able to watch that, you know, over and over and over again or share it with people. I mean, you see, we see awesome things in the woods all the time. So being able to share that is, you know, really powerful stuff and we love it. But the guys, you know, in fact, a lot of guys will even pack a camera. Almost everyone has a cell phone in their pocket while they're hunting and could video a lot of things. But actually getting that camera out and doing it and inconveniencing yourself uh, for a moment or two while you're on your hunt. It's a lot of guys don't do it. In fact, I know a lot of guys pack. I, I've done hunts where I've actually packed a big old camera and like never took it out of my backpack. You know, there's had, there have been moments where even, you know, me as a camera guy was like, yeah, I don't feel like filming my own hunt or, you know, something like that. Yeah. I've gone back and forth. I've had a couple where I think I just need to focus on, on killing the thing. Let's not complicate the <laughs> things with the camera. Then other times I'm like, okay, I'm going to film this thing. I'm going to film all the misery. And so I end up having like 30 minutes of B-roll and then nothing at all either happens or I don't get a kill shot or anything like that. Or I'm just like, what, what do you have here? You have nothing. There's nothing to really put together. There's no compelling story. And some of that <laughs> stuff you look on, on YouTube and good for the people for, for putting it out there. And a lot of times people put stuff out there and it's, it's criticized. But uh, yeah. you, you just have this, there's no real story, just a bunch of clips, and it's the filling up the fuel at the gas station, and then eating junk food, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're out there, and then, then stuff happens. But um, how, do you look for a specific like story as things are happening? Do you just, just kind of shut off the brain and shoot, or how, much, how is your brain working while you're going through all this? Um. You know, I, I, the thing that helps is that I'm a hunter as well. 
So, and I, and I think like what's behind Corey is he wants to be able to like share. Corey's big on like sharing knowledge and information with people. Um, he likes to help people. So it's honestly, it's a, that's a big driving force behind our video is to just try to show people what it looks like to go hard in the mountains, what it looks like. I mean, it's, it's a, he's a tough guy to film because we move at such a high rapid pace. But honestly, the back of my mind when I'm filming is a lot of times just like, I'm just trying to show people like what actually went down in the mountains. Cause that's what, I mean, that's what everyone loves with like, you know, following Corey and Yelp 101 crew is, is they love to see all the encounters, whether we, you know, kill the elk or we don't. Um, they love to see the encounters, the whole setup um, and, and learn from it, you know, cause Corey is a big into education. So that's, that's a big part of my focus is just trying to let people see kind of everything as it went down you know, in that moment. So it's not necessarily some story that's bigger than the hunt in our content. Like our content is more educational based, more um, like the, in the moment based. So it's, it's a little bit easier to show that because I'm not thinking of some overarching story. I'm focused more on just letting people see what happened, what went down, how we did it and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think writers tend to, look for bigger things. Like I'm already writing columns sometimes in my head when I'm out there hunting and just, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. stupid. I'm like, Oh man, this is a tragedy, isn't it? And I'm like, no, 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 stay, stay focused, stay focused. And then <laughs> afterwards you look at the whole thing and you look for a story, but I do like the kind of, as it happened type thing. Um, are there times when you, you miss something or, or, and you regret like you have to redo stuff. It doesn't seem like you're, you guys are at all the type of squad that tries to recreate certain things because you missed, like if you miss something, is Corey upset? Does Donnie make fun of you? Are you, you chastising yourself? What are you, what are you doing? Or do you yeah, ever miss anything? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. If anyone is wanting to be a camera guy, you better, it, I don't know if you got, you're going to have to learn how to deal with missing stuff or making mistakes. Um, and hopefully you work for, uh, someone who's pretty forgiving. Um, I don't miss a lot of things, but it does happen. Um, you, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. There's no way we don't have enough cameras, uh, enough batteries running 24 seven to catch every little thing that happens. So you, you do miss stuff. And a lot of, I mean, we try, we pride ourselves with trying to keep the camera running as much as possible. Um, but you know, I miss Donnie will say something hilarious and I'll just miss, I won't have the camera on and I'll be like, Oh, kicking myself. And Corey will be like, Oh, did you get that? You know? And I'm like, dude, no, I don't have the camera on right now. <laughs> you know that. And you know, they, they'll, 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 they'll mess with me a little bit sometimes, but it's all in good humor. They know, they know I'm working my butt off out there. And so if I miss something, I miss something, but yeah, I mean, the biggest things is, you know, making sure you're getting footage of the animals in the situation when it goes down and missing a kill shot is, yeah, I mean, that's, that's grounds for a good hazing. If you missed a kill shot, <laughs> I luckily, luckily have not missed one of those in a very, very long time. In fact, I don't know if I've ever missed one, nice. but we have, we have had people miss them before. And yeah, that's, that's the ultimate camera cameraman <laughs> failure is missing a kill shot. Yeah. If you're there for it. Have you moved past that moment of like nervousness when uh, the bull's coming in? And you're about ready to get that uh, that shot. Have you moved past? Oh my gosh! Don't screw this up. Are you able to just be excited or calm? Um, <laughs> Corey will Corey will tell you calm. No, not necessarily. I'm not necessarily calm. Actually, the, on this last one, I was pretty calm. It kind of depends. You can actually, I actually get a lot of the emotions that you just talked about right there. There can, there can be a little bit of nervousness. In fact, on this, uh, the bull that we got in Alaska, um, like I couldn't see him. Corey was up on the knob and I'm down the hill from the knob just slightly. So Corey's got eyes on him, but I can't move because there's about 20 cows all, you know, around just in this little valley below us. And he's worried about me skylining, trying to get up behind him. And so there is a little bit of pressure because like for me as a camera guy, I almost get as excited for Corey to shoot that bull 
as if as I get you know video of the shot shooting. The, I, I kind of butchered that horribly. Sorry, but <laughs> I get as excited to, probably as Corey shooting that bull, yeah, um, just in capturing the shot with my camera. Like I get I get so jacked if I capture a good kill shot, and so. There is, there have been times where I was very nervous. Um, there's, in fact, there's videos online that are hilarious. You actually can hear me almost like hyperventilating in the background. <laughs> um, it's almost like I'm the shooter, you know, in that situation. Um, but most of the time I'm okay. After the shot, I get a little, sometimes I'll get a little bit of shooter shock after the shot. Um, where I'll, you know, I'll get a little adrenaline rush right after the shot. Um, but most of the time I'm, I'm decent. Corey might tell you otherwise, though. <laughs> <laughs> How do you figure out angles? <clears throat> um, Ryan, uh, buddy of mine, we were up uh, archery bear hunting, and we uh, ended up calling in a wolf, and we got it to about 10 yards, and I got just a perfect picture of it, but he couldn't shoot it with his bow because his vantage, there's a little bit of a bush in the way. So how do you avoid that same sort of thing with an elk where – either you're getting great pictures, but he doesn't have the shot or he has a great shooting lane, but you don't have uh, a lane to shoot the, the film. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint... You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That is mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Yeah, no, uh, there's a huge thing between a camera guy. This is, I don't understand. It'd be very difficult for the guys who like jump around and video haunts for a lot of different people. This is where I feel super lucky is that I work with Corey a lot and the chemistry between shooter and camera guy is, is huge. It can't be overstated. Like I have hunted with him enough to know when I can move. In fact, a lot of times he's always trying to stop me, tell me not to move. And I move anyways, <laughs> just because I can, I, you know, and it's, it's also the advantage of being a hunter. Like I'm not just a camera guy. Like I understand animals. I understand their behavior. I've, you know, had lots of animals close to me, especially elk. Um, so I know what I can get away with, what I can move when I can move when I can't. Um, so that helps a tremendous amount. And then it's honestly, it's all about just staying as close, you know, as close as you can to the shooter. Like you gotta, like, you really just gotta be their shadow. And there's times, <clears throat> there was a time in Wyoming a couple of years ago where I wasn't Corey, like Corey can be tough to stick with sometimes because when he goes into kill mode, <laughs> he, he, he Predator forgets. Mode. Oh, yeah, awesome. when he goes into predator mode, he forgets about the camera guy. Like, uh, it's funny. up to me 100% to stay with him. Like, he's not going to look back and make sure that I'm with him. So, um, he's very focused in the moment when it's, you know, that's why he's been so successful is he is just hyper-focused in that moment. And so, it's, it's, it's tough. There's been times where he all of a sudden got five yards away from me and I was pinned down and couldn't close the distance to get back. And I couldn't, I, you know, got video of the bull, but I couldn't see the shot. So mm-hmm. it is a lot of, I mean, with angles, it is, and that's just tough. Like you have to, that's where a designated cameraman's huge. Like you film with your buddy and you guys are both hunting. That doesn't work because you won't necessarily be shadowing each other. 
um, perfectly. You're both thinking about, you know, hunting in that moment. And so it's, that's where like one person is designated camera guy and has to stay in the shadow, you know, within a shadow's length of the guy shooting. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really what it kind of boils down to is you got to be close. If you're not close to the shooter, then you're always going to have a different perspective than the shooter. Yeah. So when you go hunting by yourself, like, is it kind of a letdown or is it a, just a nice relief to not have all that chaos of predator quarry and all the stress? Like you were just out there and you're hunting for yourself. How does that feel? It, it, it feels great. I mean, honestly, it feels great. I enjoy the trying to capture a kill shot on camera. Um, that's just kind of like, it's like kind of the ultimate moment. I mean, there's a lot of fun things capturing. I get, you know, I'll shoot a really cool time lapse or something else. And it gets me very excited. I get super pumped. I'm like, oh my gosh, this shot is so epic. And I get you know super excited. Um, but the ultimate is like the kill shot and, and the adrenaline behind capturing a kill shot is very similar to the adrenaline of drawing your bow on a, on, you know, on an animal on your own hunt. And like just, um, I actually got my first pronghorn this year with my bow and, um, August, yeah, August 15th. So just, uh, you know, a few weeks ago and man, I, I was shaking, <laughs> <laughs> I got the shakes, I got the shakes on that, you know, which was kind of surprising. Um, cause the few deer I've shot before that I really haven't had the shakes, but yeah, I mean, I love bow hunting. So I obviously love that adrenaline of getting close, being in the animal, you know, being in close with the animal and tight. And there's, there's just emotions that come with that. Like if you're, I mean, I'm just, I'm not even gonna lie. I'm not stone cold when I'm in, within bow range of an animal. I wish I was, but yeah. If, uh, Corey and Donnie were filming you, how would that work out? <laughs> we have actually done that once. Huh. Um, we have done that once. They were both tagged out. Um, and I hadn't, that's, I mean, this is the brutal part. Like you want to talk and maybe we'll talk about this, but like the hard part of being a camera guy filming elk hunting in September, especially when you're a camera guy who absolutely loves bow hunting as much as Corey does bow hunting elk. I don't get to hunt elk with a bow very much. Mm. Like it's a, it's something you have to give up and it's, it's actually incredibly difficult. So anyways, every once in a while they'll tag out early and I'll get a couple of days to go. And yes, one time, um, I d hadn't bought a tag anywhere cause I wasn't planning on getting a chance to bow hunt. And, uh, they both tagged out and they're like, Hey, let's go run into town and get you a tag and see if we can't call a bowling for you. And it was like, we literally had one day left in the, in the season. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting. I, the hunting side of things, like having them film me hunting, like doesn't phase me at all. Cause I, I feel like I'm a little bit, you know, kind of like Corey in that system is like, it doesn't matter what's going on behind me. I'm a hundred percent focused on the animal. So I don't have any problem with that, but talking to the camera is not my favorite <laughs> i don't i don't i don't love it i'm a i don't know i'm not i'm not smooth with words not eloquent with words so it's uh yeah i don't enjoy it i'm like yeah if you guys want to film me shoot something cool that sounds cool but yeah i don't really want to talk to the camera <laughs> Well, that can be such a difficult thing but i think the expectations for people are fairly low they want someone who's in the moment talking rather than they jotted something down and here's the script that they're trying to memorize or say or something with the fake look of blue steel or something like that. So yeah, there's probably some, uh, probably some lead way on that. Yeah. Luckily our style is pretty rough and raw. Corey's pretty refined, but me and Donnie are pretty rough and raw and our style is pretty raw and in the moment. So yes, I do fit into that, <laughs> that category pretty well. Nice. So what, um, what kind of gear are you looking at? And there's, when I was, I got a degree in journalism and during my uh, photojournalism class, the, the professor was saying like, you can buy an expensive camera or you can just figure out how to take photos. He would go on assignment and he would take those disposable cameras because he said, I just know what angles are and that's fine. So rather than buy an expensive camera, I can save a ton of money. And I can take the right photo that I need with this disposable camera. So is there like a, an entry level budget thing that'll get it done or should you invest once or cry once, buy once? What do you think? Oh man. Yes to both. 
<laughs> um, you know, I'm a pretty budget. I'm not a super wealthy guy, so I'm pretty budget minded, but I actually do this professionally. Um, and it kind of, it kind of depends, honestly, like when guys like, what camera should I get? I'm like, man, whatever camera you will actually pull out and use. Cause if you buy a camera, it's so fancy, so nice, but it's really hard to use in the back country or, um, you know, it's not fun or easy to get out you'll leave it in your pack. Like you won't take it out because it's so inconvenient. So if the only thing you're willing to take out and film with is a GoPro, then buy a GoPro, you know, like, yes, you're going to get ridiculed on all your kill shots. Cause it's going to look like the animals 500 yards away mm -hmm. and no one will ever be able to see it, but at least you have a, you'll be able to film a story, you know, with it. So whatever camera you're willing to take out and use, but for guys who are, looking to do it, you know, and actually create content for like a YouTube channel. I'm big into DSLRs. Like I just, I love there's, there's camcorders are great. Like you can capture a lot of story with camcorders, but for me, and this is actually kind of tough because I don't actually get to do this much with the kind of the content I'm producing right now is the artistic side of creating stories is like a huge passion of mine. Um, and right now I'm kind of in an industry and in a position where it's just like mass content drop. Um, it's just get content out to people and you know, the art side of it is actually sacrificed to some degree. Like when I'm filming with Corey, we're moving so fast and hunting so hard that I don't have a lot of time to sit around and get all these perfect little angles and artistic shots and, and that, I mean, yeah, I, I get some time to do that and you'll see in our films, you know, in our, you know, our, our episodes that, you know, there is some artistic to it, but man, I have to work hard to get that because it moves so fast. But the one thing I love about, you know, some of the other guys that I'm watching and other films that I'm watching is the artistic side. And with a DSLR, um, they've become, you know, very inexpensive. They become, they've become very small, compact in size. Um, I'm a huge fan. Like if I, if guys were like, I want to produce high quality content, I would tell them to get a, small compact dslr and my favorite is the sony um sony a series um their crop sensor cameras like an a6600 it's actually the a6 basically the a6 series but the a6000 suit through a6600 is a very small compact dslr um it's easy to like put anywhere and the lenses that come with it are very small and you can get some artistic lenses it's also very inexpensive um those are, you know, that, if guys are talking about cameras, that's where I would point them first because you can produce one great photos with those cameras, but also great video content with those cameras as well. And so that's, I'm a huge fan of a compact DSLR setup for guys filming hunts. Mm -hmm. What, uh, t what type of lens? So it kind of depends. This is where you go. You have two different kind of two different categories for me. One is your your art lenses, and then the other thing is your I call it's for lack of better terms, it's my kill shot lens. So my kill shot or my hunt lens has to be a fairly wide zoom. It's got to go, you know. So on this like Alaska hunt, um, I actually don't own this lens. I rented it, but I wanted to try it out for my because I filmed everything with a DSLR, um, a Sony DSLR. I rented a twenty four to two hundred and forty millimeter lens. So. Um, for guys that don't really know what those numbers mean, 24 millimeters, a pretty wide angle lens. Um, and so that's kind of the minimum. In fact, you know, not spoiler alert, but we shot this bull really close quarters and 24 was almost not wide enough. <laughs> I wish I would have had <laughs> something a little wider because the bull, like I could, you could only, I only had Corey's bow in the frame with the bull. I couldn't get Corey's body in the frame with the bull cause it happens so close. Um, but you need a lens that kind of goes wide, but also can zoom in. And a lot of our hunts, almost all of our hunts are archery hunts. So you don't need a ton of zoom to film some big, long, giant rifle hunt mm -hmm. um, or rifle shot. I mean, so something of that degree. And then I ha usually carry on top of that a couple of lenses. I'll carry a very wide angle lens, which is usually like a 12 millimeter or a 14 millimeter um, prime lens. Um, and then I'll usually carry some real artsy lens and the, and the wide angle lens is for getting, you know, time lapses or, or landscape shots. And then I also have like a 30 millimeter 1.4, which I'm a big fan of. And that's just a very artistic, very shallow depth of field, 
um, kind of a portrait, wide portrait lens. Um, and those were kind of the three that I'll carry most of the time. I do have some other lenses, new, some newer lenses um, that I carry as well now, but that's typically the standard is I got a pretty big wide zoom and then I have a art lens and then I have a wide angle like landscape slash nighttime lapse, all that kind of stuff lens as well. I'm on the old Amazon right here, and there's a Sony Alpha A6400. Yep, yep, that's, that's a, a great camera. I use the A60. Camera. Yeah, those are those are great. That's a great camera. That one, I, that's a, kind of a vlogging camera, which is great because it's got an LCD screen that will flip around and face you, so that when you self film, um, you actually can make sure that you're in the shot. <laughs> nice. So a lot of this stuff, and, and with hunting, that self filming. Is it's actually really difficult because it's weird to talk to a camera while you're holding it yourself. Um, sometimes I get a little self-conscious if I'm doing that, but at the same time, it is an awesome perspective. Like no one really likes to hold the camera, but it's sometimes like I'll give Corey the camera and be like, Hey, film an interview yourself without me standing there staring at you. And honestly, some of those interviews come across so much better hmm. than, um, yeah. Anyway, so that that type of camera that you're showing right there, that's got a flip around LCD screen, is is awesome. Nice. Um, have you used a lot of GoPro stuff, or do you use uh, much of that anymore? Because that was yes. kind of the, that was kind of a, a the huge thing when the GoPro came out. That was amazing, and then there were some sound issues, and then there was the uh, you know the, the the walleye vision. But then they really refined that. I had a Hero Two, but things are way better now than they used to be. Yeah. Yes. I've had, I've had a lot of different GoPros, um, over the, over the years. And honestly, the new ones have gotten so good. Um, in fact, uh, the GoPro saved our butt in Alaska, honestly, because it was raining so hard. I was like, there's no way my DSLR is going to survive this rain. Um, and I had to keep it in a rain cover for a lot of the, you know, for a lot of it, but that GoPro, oh man. And yeah, so anyways, just talking about Go, uh, GoPro specifically, the new ones, um, and I will say I haven't used the Hero 7 a ton. Um, I have the Hero 8. Corey has two Hero 7s that he uses, and they seem to be really good. But the Hero 8 and and beyond, is they're phenomenal. The audio, they've added like multi-directional audio. Their audio is phenomenal hmm. um, compared to what it used to be. Their audio used to be just horrible on the GoPros. <laughs> yeah. And it is, they're fantastic. The cameras, I can't talk about them enough. I use them a ton. We, we carry these little uh, kind of bendy leg tripods that are about a foot long. It's about a foot tall tripod. We put the GoPros on them and you can stuff them in your side pocket of your pack and reach back, pull them out really quick and easy. And if you get these little windscreen, there's like these little foam windscreens that go over the mics, you can talk in high winds and it is outstanding. So just having like a, a quick, easy camera to get to for interviews or something funny that's happening in the moment. Um, those GoPros, they're lightweight. They're fairly indestructible. Um, they're phenomenal. I'm a huge, huge GoPro fan. They pick up the sound okay if they're in one of those waterproof cases? No. So that's one <laughs> thing I was looking through. the. I was looking through the footage. You can, but not if it's raining. Yeah. So I can hear Corey. So I, I put mine in a waterproof case because it was dumping buckets on our pack out and i was like i'm trying to capture as much of this pack out as i can um but the thing is the rain noise on the case um i wish i would have put my hand over the top of the case because there's no way to preview the audio and headphones i wish i would have put my hand over the top of the case because then actually it would have been okay and actually yes i you i can hear Corey talking and you'll see it in our you know when we release this um project you'll hear it because I'll use that footage because you can hear, hear Corey talking even through the case. It's not as good as what the case wasn't on. Um, but the rain hitting the case uh, sucked. And I was like, that's kind of <laughs> loud. That's kind of annoying. But it's still usable, man. Anything, any footage you can get, especially in the nasty situations, is, is always worth it. People are willing to hear some rain on the outside case of a GoPro if they get to see Corey loading up a bull on his back and it's dumping i mean i don't know i don't know how to describe rain but it was dumping you could pretty much drink it while you were talking that's yeah. how hard it was blowing and raining yeah this in alaska you get you become a connoisseur of of the different types of rain 
<laughs> yeah. And you like my wife is getting her PhD at University of Wyoming, and so I've I've gone down there the last couple of summers. We've scouted for for elk and whatnot. And you get those afternoon thunderstorms. My grandparents lived in Colorado, and so I'm used to the afternoon thunderstorms where it darkens and then it just dumps, and yeah. then it gets nice again. <laughs> no, yeah, not 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 here. Not uh, it doesn't Alaska. get nice when it, again. <laughs> when it decides to be nasty, you're looking at three or four days of continuous, and it'll go from like a drip to a fire hose. It can be so bad that there, when it's like that fine mist, we just call that a dry rain. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And there is no, I mean, it comes on so fast. Like yeah. there's none of this like easing into it. Like when you're in the lower 48, I've hunted a, or filmed in quite a few different states now, it eases in. There's always like a sprinkle that starts and then it slowly picks up. Oh my gosh. In Alaska, there's no warning. That's part of the reason why it was hard to get the DSLR out is because I'm like, when it starts raining, it goes from zero to full bore, just pelting you. And there's no chance, there's no time to even put a camera away or in a, in a back into a dry bag or something. So yeah, that, uh, that rain in Alaska was brutal for filming. Did you lose any cameras? Like have them broken or I'm sure you didn't like leave one on the mountain, but, uh, did any break? Uh, in Alaska? No, no, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I take really good care of my gear, probably more on the side of, you know, missing some super epic stuff, making sure I don't, cause I, I buy, I got to buy all my own cameras. And I, like I said, I'm not like super wealthy. So in fact, I, I just bought my first Sony full frame camera. Um, and I was a little nervous with how hard it was raining out there. And I had two rain covers for it. Um, and so I did use it some, but I was like leaning heavy on the GoPro and those torrential downpours because I was a little nervous, but yeah, no, I've never lost a camera. Well, I have left a camera on the mountain once, but Ooh. I went back, went back and got it the next day. That was on my own. Hunt. <laughs> so you've never, never had one, um, break you f uh, drop it, uh, weather, anything. I don't think so. I don't think I've ever broken. I don't think, yeah, I don't think I've ever, Oh, <laughs> I have, well, yeah, it doesn't work perfectly well, but yeah, on my own, I, it's, only, it's only on my own hunts that I trash <laughs> my stuff. Apparently when I'm filming other guys, it's fine, but yeah, no, I was on like a spring shed hunting trip filming and it was my own trip. And yeah, I dropped a camera and watched it roll a hundred yards down the hill Nice. and uh, watching it go <laughs> and it, it smashed the crap out of the lens and uh, autofocus doesn't work on that camera anymore. So yes, I have broke a camera, I guess. I had um, I just bought a, a new uh, Canon, and I had it set up with one of those flexi leg tripods things. I think that that you're talking about too. And I I lifted a steelhead up out of the water on the timer, took the picture, and I put the steel back in the water. So the steelhead was out for maybe two three seconds, but it flicked its tail, and its tail <laughs> grabbed on to um, the the wrap. The what what the heck is it called? The stinking strap. And it just pulled it into the water. So like that, that, that camera took one picture in its career and then was, uh, was in the water. Oh man. I put, uh, it, I put it in rice and it just, it, it just didn't end up working. Do you have yeah. like a, like uh, the rice thing, I guess works. I've never had it work. Um, is there something to do if, if you do get your camera wet, something that's going to save it? A lot of times it's that rice. I tried something new on this trip because I talked to some guys, some camera guys. Um, in fact, Adam, Adam boss, Adam boss, who has been, spent a lot of time up there. I actually got to talk with him for quite a while. Um, about, you know, dealing with cameras up there in the wet and the rain and stuff like that. And I actually tried something that actually me and him kind of speculated on, um, is those little silicone packets that you get like, when you buy uh, electronics, those little dry packets, I actually went on like Amazon and bought this huge bag of those because I was worried about lenses fogging up. Like that's like a big thing uh, with moisture is you have lenses will fog up when you're working with DSLRs and stuff. So I actually kept a lot of my lenses like in dry bags or even I mean, just a gallon size freezer bag. And I dropped like I dropped like three or four of those little dry packets in there and I never had a lens fog. Um, the entire time, which was huge. I don't know if that made the difference um, or not, but it worked for me. But yeah, that's something I tried. And I was also like, man, if something takes a dip, 
or gets too wet, I was hoping I could just throw a ton of those silicone, you know, drying packets in there within like a gallon size bag and dry out whatever I need to dry out. But honestly, I've never like, you know, I'm from the lower 48, even, you know, even more so Idaho, we don't get rain like in Idaho. So water is never an issue. So this was my first trip to Alaska and actually dealing with a lot of water. So I don't have a ton of experience with that. You know, whereas if I was filming in Alaska a lot, I guarantee you I'd have a system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Something uh, useful with those things that you just end up throwing away. Yeah, they're lightweight. Didn't take a lot to pack them. I mean, a little bit of bulk, but I mean, I brought like a whole quart size, you know, freezer bag full of them. And I used them in everything. And Mm -hmm. gear gear stayed dry for the most part. So I'm not sure if it worked. It seemed like it worked. But I, yeah, it's the first time I've ever done it. So what's on the agenda for the, is there really an off season? Like, are you just kind of waiting around for the, for the next time? I'm sure you got a ton of editing to do. Um, oh gosh. Yeah. When, when, uh, when elk hunting season's over, what's, what does the program look like for you? Um, yeah, I work, I mean, I, I have a big contract with elk 101, um, and, and with go hunt. And so I film, so I film all the hunts and then the editing on Destination Elk, I do all the editing by myself. And that is a humongous project. Usually takes me into like February, uh, you know, January. Sometimes we used to be able to release them in December and it was brutal, (laughs) but uh, no, usually for, yeah, usually from here, it's, it's a ton of video editing. You're just editing all these projects. um, And then mainly that Destination Elk project is a humongous project. So it keeps me busy for months editing that. And then after that, I do a, uh, just a lot of odds and ends. After that, I kind of go back to my own personal business to some degree. And I'm, you know, I shoot real estate videos and all sorts of small business videos, but it also in the same time, I also do a lot of the content, uh, social media, uh, marketing content for elk 101. So I'm pretty busy with that building out, you know, a calendar of all the things that we want to do and subjects we want to talk about. Cause it's, all educational base. So I actually stay, you know, I actually almost kind of almost to some degree of work part time for Elk 101 through the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. So when you put the, do the video editing, you use iMovie, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what, uh, what, what do you use uh, for that? So I use, uh, I use the Adobe Premiere Suite. Okay. Um, it was, you know, I started actually with Final Cut and used Final Cut for a long time. But when Final Cut had a problem with DSLRs or you had to convert all your footage way back in the day when you're using DSLRs with Final Cut, I switched to Adobe Premiere because you didn't have to do that and just self-taught myself on both those programs. You know, there's enough content on YouTube that you can learn any, you know, editing, you know, software these days. Yeah. Um, no problem. So. But yeah, I use the Adobe Suite because I, I, mean, I was a graphic designer, so I already know Photoshop and Illustrator. So using Premiere Pro is like no big deal. It wasn't hard. What would you recommend for someone getting in? Because if you go, if some random person who has a, they say they have a passion for photography and like, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to film some hunts. I'm going to spend a grand on this camera. I'm going to spend whatever the Adobe Premiere, like that's, that's a pretty, the, the suite's pretty expensive, right? The, the creative suite. Yeah. If you get, you can get the whole suite for like 50 bucks a month. Um, I think you can rent just Premiere Pro, um, for a little bit cheaper. And, and it's like, they all, it's pretty much all that stuff is on a monthly basis. Now, um, you, you buy just like a monthly rental. So if you were going to do it, you know, just hunting, you could probably just do like a one year rental on it and get all your editing done then decided what you wanted to do for the next year or even just maybe even a couple of months. But, uh, yeah, I, I haven't used any of these like little knockoffs or lower end editing softwares. Um, in fact, when I have people that try to use them and I'm trying to help them, it's usually a total pain. Mm. There's just like a lot of things that aren't there, but there is like, I don't know. I can't tell you for sure if this, you can get this as a standalone, but there's a program inside of Adobe called Adobe rush. And it's a watered down version of premiere. Um, and Adobe rush, I actually know a couple of guys who kind of produce their own stuff. It's normally like little product videos or something. And they use Adobe rush and they love it. It's like really easy to use. 
very basic and it's super easy to export out of Adobe Rush to like YouTube or Vimeo, um, any of those, you know, kind of online video sources. Um, so I haven't used it a ton. I did help him once with it and I was like, oh, this is pretty slick. And it's just a watered down version of Premiere. Um, and I don't know if it's cheaper or not, but that would be something to check out for sure is Adobe Rush. Mm -hmm. You can spend a lot of money on a lot of great gear, but it doesn't make up for the fact that you don't have good content. So yes. what are some things that you would recommend for someone who maybe wants to do this, but is maybe stuck with cell phone videos and, and using iMovie? Um, what are some things to look for when, uh, when trying to put some content out there that doesn't necessarily have much of a budget? Yeah, no, totally. The, you don't have to have, in fact, there's been a lot of, you, there's actually YouTube, whole YouTube videos that have been shot with iPhones and um, there's a lot of talent. If you've got talent, it doesn't really matter what camera you're using. But I will say this, like if you're going to try to produce, because um, I'm a budget minded guy, I don't have super fancy equipment. In fact, it kills me. I, so many of the guys in my industry, you know, like are touting the latest and greatest. And I mean, there's a, camera body that i have been eyeing forever that i want so bad because i want to be able to shoot 4k uh 120 frames per second basically be able to shoot 4k slow-mo you know and watch that arrow dip over you know and, and you know blow through the bull or something like that but i can't have, i can't personally even afford that camera it's like it's insane and so being budget-minded um but also really trying to produce good content is like i would say it's a good it's a it's a niche of mine something that i think about constantly but for those guys that are you know it, audio is huge when you get into the lower budget stuff usually you're sacrificing audio and so if you're going to film with a cell phone get a little microphone that plugs into your camera um that way you can record you know decent audio um i think audio is what destroys the low budget guys the fastest is usually i, I mean our cell phones have great 4k cameras on them now um almost everyone's cell phone probably shoots 4k and so you have quality quality video shooting in your hand just with your cell phone but it's not you know your audio is going to be brutal really really bad and so audio inexpensive audio adapters are go a long ways for budget guys guys that are working on a budget and trying to produce quality um and then the other thing yeah, is, is editing, almost everyone has image stabilization in their camera. So, you know, having a camera that's like super shaky is also like a big, right. it's, it's fun for a while. Like, I mean, if you're running from a bear, yeah, shaky footage makes sense. But when you're, you know, filming a blacktail eating, you don't want shaky footage. You don't want your audience being nauseated. Yeah, thrown up is no, no good. So, <laughs> so um those are kind of some tips, some quick tips is, you know, it, camera stabilization, making sure, which usually isn't a problem now with even, you know, a modern cell phone. Um, and then audio. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are two really big things that could help, you know, the lower budget guys go. And then it's, it's about angles, um, understanding angles, understanding framing. Um, if you're using a cell phone, you can do some really cool stuff if you understand that just touching the screen changes the focus point and you can, you know, focus on one thing and then tap somewhere else, focus on the next thing, or you put, you know, things in the foreground and your subjects in the background so that it creates a depth of field look. It's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of cool tips. I mean, there's stuff on YouTube you could learn and Instagram and all this kind of stuff that will show you how to do this, mm -hmm. but you can create some, great content you know even with just a cell phone is there obviously everybody has their different preferences when it comes to any sort of content pictures video whatever but is there something when you're looking through a filmed hunt that there's a shot that just kind of makes you roll your eyes like it's just so tired and cliche and like oh gosh there it is or do you care uh yeah usually and every once in a while i and i'm guilty of doing this every once in a while i can't stand the interviews behind the animals <laughs> like after you after you've got the animal it's like the whole group is sitting behind the animal and you're doing this interview telling the story yeah. it's like man if you're having to tell the story about what just went down behind the animal then you missed a ton of stuff before leading up to it 
And so that's one shot that I can't stand, which is funny because I'm thinking back and I'm like, we did that with Donnie's Bowl <laughs> opening day. Um, and I was like, but that was different. That was for Destination Elk where we had to talk about, you know, we were giving away something because Donnie killed that bull. But I was like, man, I, I can't stand that shot. Like the only, when you get to the animal, it's the, all your video footage from that point on at the animal should just be artistic and peaceful, respectful, you know, at that moment, it shouldn't be like, Hey, let's sit behind the animal and talk about this trophy we just harvested. And it's like, I I just, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, there's always, um, a reason to do any of the things like there's always something that okay in this case it would work but yeah by and large that one's kind of a yeah yeah kind of packaged but yeah it is what it is <laughs> yeah wow. exactly well what yeah, else you I got man oh sorry go ahead oh yeah no i and that's the thing is like i don't like to tell people what they can and can't do like when it comes to yeah. you know this when it comes to filming your hunts i mean for the guys who are doing it because they want to share something and it's artistic, you know, and they want to put an artistic flair into it. I'm like, man, do, do whatever you want, have your own style. Maybe I don't like your color scheme. Maybe I don't like your editing style, but, but do you like, don't do what everyone else is doing just because that's what you feel like you have to do. And so, I mean, there's some guys, there's, there's some guys producing just a lot of awesome content out there. In fact, you know, I just watched the one that Jason Matzinger did um, called Landlock. If you haven't watched that film project, that is really, really good. Um, but there's, you know, there's just a lot of guys out there that are producing fairly low budget stuff that is really, really good. And, if you know, you watch their stuff and just see how they're telling their story and, and then slow down and rewatch it again the second time and then see, you know, kind of their, how they're filming it what their film style is because almost everyone is going to film a hunt. Like you got to film the hunt first to to some degree. And then you have to have the art almost kind of secondary. It's really hard to film a hunt and get art the exact same time. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and moments happen like that, but you know, a lot of times you're filming the hunt first and then you're trying to grab. And when I say art, it's just kind of like the beauty that's happening around you. You know, in the moment, you know, the sun rises, the sun sets, the, you know, the wind storms, the rain storms, you know, whatever beauty and the, the nature and the moment that's getting thrown at you, trying to capture that as well, um, is, is huge. Like being able to capture what's going on around you besides the hunt is what takes your films from, you know, mediocre, okay, to, you know, next level. That's where, you know, you see the guys producing really, really good stuff is when you're able to kind of fully immerse yourself in what they're going through in their hunt because they have so much, you know, I call it art, but it's really just filming the nature, you know, filming what's actually, what, you know, what you're actually immersed in in that moment. Do you kind of scroll through or go down the YouTube vortex looking at uh, just everything that's out there? Or do you have a couple of people that you follow and, and just kind of look at their stuff? Um, no, I check. I mean, there's a lot of new guys popping up and it's kind of funny because, you know, I got started doing the same thing, doing, uh, I was with a group called pure elevation originally they're actually part of our destination health project this year. But, uh, I started with them and I mean, I look back at some of our old stuff and I'm like, (laughs) it's just laughable. And so I try to be super gentle when I'm watching, a, you know, some of these new crews that are starting up and you can tell they got a really fancy camera, but, you know, they're not really sure how to use it yet or, you know, or what their style is yet or, you know, how to fully tell the story. And so I try to be gentle. But, yeah, I mean, I, I try to watch a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, honestly, and what got me started back in the day was just videoing a authentic, real feeling. I was, you know, watching the hunting shows on TV were just brutal. I can't do staged. You can't reenact drawing a bow. If you miss the guy drawing the bow, it's over. Do not (laughs) refilm that, that, you know, it was just ridiculous. And, and so the real and the raw is just always been a huge passion. And so when I see anyone, 
filming, um, you know, new guys starting in and they're like, oh, we missed the kill shot. So let's film a guy drawing a bow and just shooting a broad head into a tree stump or something to make it sound like he shot the elk. Yikes. I'm just like, I, that, I just turn it off. Like, that's just an instant turn off for me. Um, and so, but anything that's raw and real, I mean, if a guy films a whole hunt with a cell phone, but it's raw and real and in the moment, I'm into it. I'm, you know, I'm intrigued. I want to see, you know, what's going to go, what's going to happen, what's going to go on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of one when I watch, but yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of guys. I mean, Matt Singer puts out some phenomenal films. There's, there's kind of two different sides in the industry right now. I don't know. People will probably notice this. You'll probably notice this right away. There's kind of the mass content dump side of things where guys are just filming, filming a hunt, get it out there, show people. Um, and then there's kind of the film side of it where it's artistic, it's telling a story and it's, it's tough. Cause like right now I'm kind of in the mass content dump, uh, dump side of things. Um, it is on the educational side. So that makes a little bit of sense in, in that regard, but I really miss guys that tell a good story. And, and I think that's why like the landlock series with Matt Singer, um, that he just put out. Like when you get a good story, it's awesome, you know, and guys like top priority. Um, and there's some other, some other, uh, film crews. I know I'm missing some that are doing actually films. They're still doing films. And it's like, man, I miss the films with the story. And as a writer, you got to love that because the story is huge, you know, and the hunting footage can sometimes be, you know, subpar, maybe not even that good, but if the story's there, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It seems like video would be so much easier because all you're doing is just, you just press record and you don't have to write anything, but it's, <laughs> it's so difficult because it is visual and people are so critical, um, when it comes to, to what you're looking at and you're kind of getting past that first, however long it takes to get good. Cause the first thing you do, like your first podcast is going to suck. Your first article that you send somewhere that gets rejected is going to suck. The first article you send to a magazine to get published and it is published, it's still going to suck compared to where you're going to be in a year or so. So yeah. um, I think getting past that's been, I, I put some just awful um, hunts together, but I keep them under two minutes. That way it's like the misery can only last about two minutes just trying to document. <laughs> I, mean, I took the, the, the videos and, you know, people are looking for stuff. So I just, it's just filmed with the cell phone under two minutes there you go yeah but, uh yeah there's a lot of confidence that comes into it i think there are a lot of people who are not quite sure of themselves yet and they want they want to step forward and they want to do it and they but they're just afraid of the rejection or or something but you just gotta you just gotta have the wherewithal to, to make it happen yeah and you know the short things that happen to you like it may not be a, you, you know, maybe you go on a caribou hunt and it wasn't that cool. Like there wasn't actually that, that much awesome footage, but you have a cool encounter with a pack of wolves or something. Just post that cool encounter with a pack of wolves. I mean, this is kind of like the, you know, we have the two different sides of, right now. We have the, the film and the story side of content that we're producing, you know, with the videos uh, side of things. And then we have, you know, just the content side of things where you just kind of, you put something out that in like a moment, you're almost just sharing just a moment of what happened, you know, like I, there was a, like with a hissing bull, I don't know if you ever saw the clip of that <laughs> bull that came in. That was crazy. Got five yards. Yeah. Just that clip by itself. I mean, it just blew people away. Yeah. Like it was such a cool, just moment, you know, Corey's got this bull on the ground sitting there in front of him. He's already, he's already shot a bull. And then the big herd bull comes walking in and almost fights that bull, dead bull on the ground right in front of us. Like he was super mad. And, uh, just that one moment was so cool to be able to share with people. And that's, you know, those are the things like, don't forget about that as well. If you have cool moments that happen to you in the woods, like share them. It doesn't have to be a whole film, a whole story. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, that's a great send off, man. Where can uh, people find you? Um, where can they find your work and, and all that stuff? Yeah, I, I'm pretty much just uh, all my contents on Elk 101 right now. But I've done, you know, I've, I've done work for quite a few different people. I have a website, um, IdahoMediaSolutions.com. But honestly, I haven't done anything with that website in probably the last 10 years. So <laughs> most of my most of my stuff that you're going to see, you know, maybe some of the Pure Elevation stuff, um, PureElevation.com, uh, film crew, and then also the Elk 101. I've been working with Elk 101 and putting all their videos out for the last, 
last six years. So pretty much on YouTube, elk101.com is you're going to see a lot of the content that we do um, there as well. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for all that you're doing. Love, uh, love the product and um, good luck uh, the rest of this fall. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Taking off again here in like four or five days to film the next time. Got everything, everything dried out, luckily, ready to go. Luckily, luckily this one's in Idaho, so <laughs> I will not be dealing with rain. Thank goodness. Yeah. You got the memory. That's the authentic Alaska. You got it. Yeah. No, we got it. We earned it for sure. <laughs> uh, we, we did it right. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you, bud. See ya.